leave the new page, the new Sunday school, or Sunday school, new Wednesday night topics here. The rule of private interpretation. Basically, what I mean by that, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, is that there's no contradictions in the Bible, there's no mistakes in the Bible, there's no errors in the Bible. I was thinking about that. This really is a book like no other book. This is God's book. This is how we can have faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Here's how we can find out about salvation, how to make sure you're going to heaven someday. That's in 2 Timothy there, chapter 3, verse 15. That you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. This book is, is a special book. God inspired it in the original writers, and then he promised preservation. So that means this book today is as perfect as the originals are. That's, right. That's what right. it means, preservation. Now that doctrine of preservation, some people question that, some people don't believe it. But I do, and I believe the Bible teaches preservation too. Today in particular, though, we're going to be talking about uh, the, the whole issue of, are there mistakes in the Bible? Of course, you know the answer to that. <clears throat> in fact, on the notes, Anybody need a set of notes, please? Please go back and get a copy, or we'll get someone to give you a copy if it's difficult for you. Make sure you have a copy. Uh, at the top, it's the rule of private interpretation there. And we're going to start in John chapter 10, verse 35. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 35. Now, let me say this too. Some of these verses can be understood in other ways, a few of them. A little differently, and there's some different thoughts on some of them. But the main, again, the main thought I want to bring up with this subject is that there are no mistakes in the Bible. There's no contradictions in the Bible. And this is a big book. There's a lot of pages here. I don't know how many. I think it's 70 hours. I think, if I remember right, if you want to read the Bible through, it takes it takes 70 about 70 hours just reading at a normal speed. And I don't think you should sit down and try to read it all at once. That's a long time, 70 hours. But I think that's, if I remember right, that's the statistic I heard. There's a special book here. And so John chapter 3, verse 35, will be the first one. And the Lord talked about the scripture cannot be broken. In other words, you can't find any mistakes in it. It's perfect. It can't be broken because there's a protector in back of this book too. And that's God himself. People say, well, it's been thousands of years, 2,000 years since the writing of the New Testament and 3,000 years or more since the writing of the Old Testament. I mean, that's a lot. People think that's a long time. How can you still believe it like you do today without any errors in it today? Because God's in it. Amen. And if God promises to do something, it doesn't matter how many thousands of years go by. If he promises to do something, it's going to get done and stay done the way he does things. So that's why we believe it's perfect today. That's why this book is like no other book. It's God's book. It's his way to talk to us and tell us what we need to learn. I have that one track. I really like that one track. Read the Bible. Why? Well, we have some of those in the track rack. I think if we don't, I'll get some there. But I, I'd like to mail that out. When I get my bills, electric bill, gas bill, phone bill, garbage bill, Kimball. That's a Kimball. Someone picks up our trash. I always include that track. I want people to think about that. The yeah. Bible. The Bible's the word of God. In fact, on the notes, we'll read John chapter 10 here in just a minute. On the notes, on the front page, about two-thirds of the way down, in, in the dark, bold print. So on the notes, about two-thirds of the way down in the dark, bold print, where it says, note. It says, note, is the Bible really filled with contradictions? Now, in reality, there are no contradictions in the Bible. Now, this next part you're going to have to think about a little bit. Only uh, a uniform condition, un should be uninformed condition, conclusions. Now, based on a premise that the Bible must be wrong. Some people look at the Bible, they read the Bible, they think, well, the Bible's got some errors in it, so I'll read it with that idea that there's mistakes and errors in the Bible. Don't do that. I don't think anybody here would, but out there they would. But it's only, they come, first of all, they, they don't understand there's no con contradictions in the Bible. Only uninformed conclusions. They, they, they read the Bible with conclusions already made. They think there's mistakes in it already before they can start reading it. So they can kind of pick and choose what they can believe and what they don't have to believe. Uh, based on the premise that the 
Bible must be wrong because before, rather, before any serious investigation is made, if a person is sincerely interested in discovering the truth, he can always find the truth. So the attitude in back of the Bible as you begin to read it, anytime you read it, is important. If you're looking for mistakes, maybe you'll find some. But it won't be uh, a real mistake, it'll be something that's imagined, something that's thought of, because people want to find mistakes in the Bible. They don't want the Bible to be right, because they don't like what it says. So, John chapter 10, all right, John chapter 10, verse 35. And it says, and the Lord is speaking here, and he talked about, well, let's back up to verse 34 at least. Yeah. And if to make it even happier, we'll back up to verse 33. Yeah. Verse 33, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. A man speaking who says he is God. Now they got it right. But they didn't believe what they heard. That's a lot of people. They get it right, but they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Then verse 4, 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? Now the word gods there just means, they used to call some people gods because they, they uh, were great in some certain ways. They gave the small letter G, gods. I won't get into that tonight. But, but then in verse 35 he says, If he called them gods, I mean, you looked up to some people, admire them for what they've accomplished unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture, here's the part now that applies, the scripture cannot be broken. Cannot be broken. In other words, nobody can find any mistakes in false word can be broken where you don't have to believe it because there's mistakes in it. The scripture cannot be broken. Then it says, say of him whom the Father had sanctified and sent unto the world of blasphemous because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me that. If, I, if the works I'm doing aren't right, don't believe me that. But if I do, though he believe not me, believe the works, that he may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Because the Lord did miracles. He did miracles. And they saw him do those miracles. How else are they going to explain it? The miracles are really could not be questioned. If those miracles could be questioned, like you see, you know, faith dealers today doing so-called miracles, and some of them are really found out from, from using devious means, some of them really are found out, but the Lord says here, he, he did miracles, they never questioned the authority and the reality of his miracles. They never questioned the man with the withered hand. Other miracles at the Lord that he did a lot more that's not written in the Bible here. They never questioned whether they really happened, whether they really were miracles, they really did heal, and so forth. Because if they would have questioned it, they would have looked foolish. They would have looked foolish to the people. So they didn't question it, but they had to come at him some other way, some other way. So that's how they did here there uh, in, in different ways. But anyway, in the middle of this whole thing, it's the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture is real, it's powerful, it's, it's a, a unit, it's united together, you can't break it apart. Can't break it apart. All right, next verse, Acts 17, verse 11, can you recite that from memory? I, I had it memorized one here a few months ago, and I have the hardest time with this verse. This is one of those. Let's see, Acts 17, 11. Yeah, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And that's the way we need, that's the attitude we need to have to be skeptical unless you really found out it is in the Bible. Other than that, be skeptical. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's true, you'll find it's true. If it's true, there'll be no question about it. So it doesn't hurt to be skeptical, but don't be so much of a skeptic that you don't believe the truth even when you find the truth. That's where the problem comes in. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 2. Because this question of are there mistakes, are there contradictions in the Bible? No, there's none. None at all. Uh, we've even had a class one time on seeming contradictions in the Bible. I went through different ones. And we had, I don't know how long it went, but several weeks on that. 
different con so-called contradictions in the Bible. Explained all of them. First Corinthians chapter two, verse thirteen. And let's see, here we are. First Corinthians chapter two, verse thirteen. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teach. It's not just from man, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Of course, the Holy Ghost is God, God the Holy Ghost. And then it says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now that's what we're doing. It's a comparison. And when you do the right kind of comparison, there's no contradictions. Just to think, there's no contradictions in this Bible. Let me ask you, has anybody you've talked to or witnessed to, or just maybe they brought up the subject, told you, oh, there's just so many contradictions, or there's contradictions in the Bible. Have you ever heard that from anybody? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think everybody has. And how did you answer that? You could just say, no, there isn't. Yeah. Or you could say, like some people do, show me, yeah, show me one. Yeah, yeah. Show me one of the contradictions. And then usually what their answer is, they'll say, oh, they're just all over the place. <laughs> Everybody knows about it. And that's their answer because you've embarrassed them because they can't even come up with one example of it. But comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And then 2 Timothy 2.15, study the shall I sell the food unto God, a work that needs not to be ashamed. Um, right, like right the dividing word of truth. And then 2 Timothy 3.15, 3, 3.16, all, 3, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is Profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works. Did I miss a word there? Yeah, I left, left the one out there. All scripture here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You want to profit spiritually, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. For correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's such an important verse there. Verse 16 again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable now for doctrine, for reproof, to tell you what you're doing wrong. People don't like that reproving. Reproof. For correction, here's what you should do right then. So here's what you're doing wrong. For correction, here's what you should do right. And for instruction and righteousness. And here's what the right act, uh, attitude is. So all those things, all those things are involved there. And then let's see, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. And this is the one that I put in the bulletin Sunday as one of the main verses tonight. And there are some different thoughts on this one too. 1 Peter chapter... Or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. There's some different things. Then, of course, yeah, in verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Some people think that moved by the Holy Ghost means they were kind of almost like in a trance. And God spoke through them and they wrote out, out and they were kind of in a trance as they were writing. I don't believe that was the, the way it was actually done. I believe they understood what was being, uh, what they were writing. I, I believe God worked through their thought processes as they wrote. But some people believe it was kind of some kind of mystical trance they were in when they wrote the Bible. I don't think that's true though, but some people believe it along that line. But again, verse 20, verse 20. So knowing this first, here's something you need to know first of all. First, that no prophecy of the scriptures have any private interpretation. The way I, I understand private interpretation, what my thought is here, is that it means you cannot interpret any verse of the Bible without looking at other parts of the Bible where that subject or that doctrine is brought up. Right. So don't interpret or try to understand one verse out of context. Right. Don't try to understand one verse without comparing it to other parts of the Bible. If you bring out one verse and you have an understanding of that verse, but other parts of the Bible contradict your understanding of that one verse, then that's not the right understanding. Yeah. It all has to fit together like we have uh, puzzles we put together. We have to get all the pieces together. 
First of all, usually what people do is they get the frame, you know, the outline, the frame first, and they work out everything else work. Same thing with the Bible. There's pieces here in the Old Testament, there's pieces in the New Testament, different kinds of doctrine. That's how you have to work it. Because it's all, the truth is all over the place. Sometimes, as we already studied, one of these rules of Bible study, sometimes it is one portion of Scripture where a lot of information is given. That's true, too. But the point I want to bring up tonight, there's no mistakes in the Bible. There's no contradictions in the Bible. There's no errors in the Bible. If there are, it's not God's Word. Clear enough? Clear enough. Clear enough? All right, let's look at the notes. Look at the notes here. All right, the top again under the Bible verses. And then Scripture is the Word of God in written form. Honestly, friend, that, that thought amazes me. It's really got my attention years, years ago. God doesn't speak to us verbally. We can't hear God talking anymore. Despite some people saying, God told me this and God told me that. No. Uh, God does not speak to us verbally. He does not speak to us in visions and things like that anymore. He did the Old Testament. Even the Old Testament, they had the scripture was their main source for knowing God. But they did have prophets in the Old Testament. But they don't have prophets in that sense today. But scripture is the, the, in written form. It's in a book. Christianity is called a book religion. That's why you need to read the Bible, the Word of God here. This is all of it right here. One thing I try to do when I witness to people is try to get them in the Word of God. Amen. Try to get them interested enough to read the Bible. Like that one person I talked to, I said, well, do whatever you know you're not doing now already. They asked me what I should do. You know, they were really sincerely getting interested. And I said, well, do what you're not doing now, what you know you should be doing, but you're not doing now. And that was basically two things. You know you should be going to church. Yep. And they said, yeah, I know. Then start going to church. You know you should be reading the Bible. Yeah, you know you should be reading the Bible. Then start reading the Bible. Do the things you already know you're not doing. And then from that step onward, God will show you. And you'll know what you need to do. You'll need to, you know, you'll need to know what that next step is. Only until you do the first steps. Find out the places that you're being disobedient. Begin there with obedience. If you're not going to the church, start going to church. If you're not reading the Bible, start reading the Bible. Do what you already know you're doing wrong. Or not ignore, let's put it that's a better word. So read the Bible. This, this book is an amazing book. Yes. It's been here 2008 years ago. People have been martyred, killed, murdered because they had a copy of this book. People fled in terror from the government. It's always the government. Yeah. And, and the, the, sometimes the religion and back of the government that doesn't want people to have the Bible. This book right here, how many people have died because of this book? Obeying it, having a copy of it. I mean, read some of those books, Martyrs and Mirrors and the, uh, some of those other books like that. All right, so the book is so important. Going on here in the, in the notes. So scripture is the word of God in written form. I know that just amazes me. Just amazes me. Every time I pick up the Bible, God's talking to me. Yeah. Every time I read the word of God, that's like God talking. That's the way he talks to us today. Amen. The word of God, a written Bible here. Understand and never get used to the Bible either. That's good. Every time you open it up or you hold it, don't, I, I, I never like these preachers that they get, they get all wound up preaching, they take the Bible, they throw the Bible down on the, on the board. Don't, yeah. don't do that. This is the Word of God. Right Amen. Here. Amen. So special, so important. So the Word of God, treat it with respect, even carry it with respect. <laughs> so Scripture is the Word of God is written for. Next thought line here in the notes. The Bible is God's Word and without any contradictions, mistakes, or error. How many times have I said that tonight already? But hold on. We're going to say it again. Next line. All scriptures without contradiction and consistent with any and all other parts of scripture. Next line. The written word of God, authorized version, King James Bible. Do the study, do the history on that. You'll come to the same conclusion. Authorized version, King James Bible, is to be accepted, believed, and valued as accurate and perfect, that is without error. Who wrote those last two lines? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wrote that down. I like that. The written word of God, authorized 
Version, King James Bible, is to be accepted, believed, and valued as accurate and perfect. That is without error. Mm -hmm. People have asked me, in fact, the last few weeks, if you have again, when, when the Bible gets old, really worn and kind of, you, you throw away the old Bibles that are, you know, I still don't know what to do exactly with that. The old, I've got a few old ones yet. I still have the original Bible I was reading when I got saved. It was given to me down there uh, by somebody. It was one of those Bibles with the zipper on the outside. And I was reading that. That's what I was reading. I still have it upstairs in my library there. Every time I look at it, I think, there it is. There's the Bible. The Word of God. I was reading that actual Bible right there when I got saved, when I got convicted, bowed the knee, and prayed for salvation and forgiveness from the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyways, the word of God, the word of God, accepted, believed, and valued as accurate and perfect without error. All right, next thought here, now in the brackets, we're starting the ones in the brackets here. This rule means that the Bible will be without differences in doctrine or any truth throughout. All the different doctrines that we believe will be true in the Old Testament, New Testament, every part of the Bible. We believe in salvation by grace. That's true in every part of the Bible. All ages, all dispensations, salvation by the grace of God. Works isn't involved at all, or it's not grace. Any kind of work involved in, in grace destroys the concept of grace. A salvation, Jesus Christ is God. He's God deity. He's God in the Old Testament. He appeared in the Old Testament times. He's New Testament, of course. We know more readily because now we have the New Testament scriptures too. No doctrine has changed. Sometimes God changes his methods and the ways of dealing with people. Uh, that's true, like God even repented of uh, destroying some nations because they repented of their sin. God will change some of the, those kind of things, but never any kind of doctrine or absolute truth. It's true Old Testament or New Testament. So this rule will be true without differences in doctrine or any truth throughout. You say, Pastor, do we really need to hear this? This is some real basic stuff. You know, there's a lot of people that don't believe the basic stuff anymore either. Right? They're turning from things. Next one in brackets here. There are some, there are some who claim that there are contradictions in the Bible. And we'll give some, some supposed examples, but then they, I should have put this in there, but then they close their ears. Because yeah. they don't want to hear an answer. But all can be explained if sincerely and honestly study and appraised. And that's it, sincerely and honestly study. Yeah. If they sincerely look at it. Because there are answers to everything. There are. But people don't want to hear the answers. So they ask you the question, then they leave. <laughs> Number three, the third one in brackets here. The rule of private interpretation means that the full truth in God's word on any given subject must not be understood from an isolated passage from other portions of scripture. Right. Did that make sense or is that too wordy? You don't take one verse here and isolate from every other part of the Bible where that verse or that doctrine, that truth might be brought up. You don't isolate from anything else. That's why we have problems with people uh, baptizing people and things as part of salvation, all kinds of different things. We'll deal with a couple of them here as we continue on. But the rule of private interpretation, you don't isolate Bible verses from each other. When, when you've got it right, they all fits together like that picture puzzle. Next one. Mainly, we are saying there are no contradictions in the Bible. Exclamation point. Amen. You see the exclamation point there? You know why I put that there? Because I want to say it loud. Good. Mainly, there are no contradictions in the Bible. Amen. No contradictions in doctrine, in statistics, in facts, in history, in science. In any, oh, I have history down there twice. Wow, okay. I'll change that for next week. Uh, in history. In history, in science, in history, in doctrine, in statistics, in facts. Everything, everything, no contradictions, even in the smaller things, even in the smaller things. God is perfect in his word here. Next one in brackets. When the Bible is interpreted in the correct way, there's no contradictions in it. In fact, now this is important. It's a real important. Here. In fact, this is a test, a way to determine the correct inter interpretation and to reject the false. This, this way helps people to understand why the cults are wrong. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this way, this method of understanding that the whole Bible is, is without contradiction is why I read that magazine, a little bit of that magazine, Sunday morning in Sunday school, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist 
and say, well, you'd be keeping the Sabbath. Well, well that why, this is why that is wrong. Then it says here, if there seems to be a contradiction, keep studying until that contradiction is resolved. There are answers. There's answers to everything. Next bracket. The cumulative revelation, including all of the Bible, is to be included on any given doctrine or subject. I think we kind of said that already. Next one. No part of Scripture is to be interpreted apart from or isolated from the rest of God's Word. Just another way of saying the same thing I've been saying. Next one. Beware of proof texting, which does not include or excludes other parts of the Bible. People say, you know, like in the end of the yeah, Mark there talks about accepting bat being baptized, they have to be baptized. But but uh, you have to understand there's other part portions in the Bible where it talks about baptism too, and it, it says that baptism, any good work we do, including baptism, doesn't get people saved. Well, we'll talk about baptism. But Paul said, I baptize none of you. Yeah. If baptism is salvation, is Paul saying, I didn't get any of you saved? But anyways, that's a lot of different thoughts there. But that's why I've got to bring up everything around these different doctrines. So no part of the scriptures be determined apart from, isolated from God's word. Beware of proof texting. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses, they can, they can bring up some verses that seem to support what they believe. Other ones that you've talked to, they can bring up some Bible verses that seem to back up what they believe. So proof texting. Now we do that also. Because we have our doctrines and we can bring up some, some text that uh, teach a certain doctrine. And that's our, we need to know our doctrine. We proof text in, the, in a different way because we, we proof text in the right way. Yeah. So what I'm saying is we're right when we do proof texting and they're wrong when they do proof texting. Amen. But that doesn't sound right, does it? But it's the truth. Proof texting. Be careful that you believe in salvation by grace. What text can you come up with? Chapter and verse, like we used to say down there. Chapter and verse, chapter and verse. Where does it teach that in the Bible? Well, sometimes people can come up with a chapter and verse that's not, not right. They misunderstand it. Next bracket there. Many, many false doctrines and heresies arise from this type of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is Bible interpretation. So we have baptismal regeneration. You have to be baptized to be saved. You know what I found too? A lot of people, I, I, I don't know if this has always been true, but a lot of people believe you have to be a church member to be saved. I've been talking to people, I want to join your church. We've had people that have been in our church one time, and they, I want to join your church. Mm -hmm. I started hearing that a lot. They want to join your church. I want to be a member of your church. I, I, I've talked to people that never been to our church, and they, they tell me, I want to be a member of your church. <laughs> well, just come out to church. See, they're, they're putting an importance on church membership they shouldn't be. They're not understanding it correctly. Just like baptism. Baptism. So baptismal regeneration, you're not saved when you get baptized. But how many people need to hear that? How many Baptists need to hear that? Yeah. Of course, then there's infant baptism, where we're all aware of bad, how wrong that is. Healings, that's another subject that's brought up. Well, he, he died for our sins, but physical healing it talks about. And tongues, oh, the, the subject of tongues, one of our favorite subjects is speaking in tongues, Sabbath keeping, raising the dead. Those are some of the things that people believe because the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches it, they think, but they're proof texting, but they're not in taking other parts of the Bible, other scriptures that show that what they believe about one thing in one place, they're misunderstanding. They need to bring the whole Bible, and then you get the complete picture. Also then going on, also recognized by what they deny, they deny the deity of Christ. Uh, you're the, like the Pharisees, they didn't believe he was God himself. The Trinity, that's one of the things that really separates, you know, Bible-believing churches, our kind of churches to, from the, uh, the cults, the Trinity. Boy, the, the cults that trip over that, don't they? They say, how can there be three gods and one, you know, one God? They say, are there three gods? No, it's not three gods. Well, it's one God, right? Well, that's not the three. No, it's God and three persons. In a sense, we cannot completely comprehend, but it's still true. 
there's things in the Bible I believe, even though I can't really comprehend them. I can't comprehend that God is eternal. I cannot comprehend that God always exist, existed, yeah. that he's out of time. Yeah, he's out of this time sequence that he, he created. I, I can't comprehend it, but I believe it. Yeah. I believe it, but I can't really comprehend. Like I say, God is a lot smarter than we are. Our knowledge is limited. Our knowledge is limited. We are not as knowledgeable or as intelligent or as understanding as God is. God is smarter than us. By the way, I like the intelligence that he has given us, though. I, I enjoy studying and learning and, 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 and growing in these areas, too, where you learn more all the time. It's an exciting thing to learn something new. In a sense, I'm glad God didn't, didn't give us complete knowledge when we were saved. Uh, it's an area we need to grow in. We need to learn more and all the time. It's a wonderful area, but we have our limits. I think Charles Spurgeon said that one time. He said, there is a limit to our understanding. There's a limit to our intelligence, but there's no limit to God's understanding. There's no limit to God's knowledge, but there is to us. The Trinity, I believe it. I can't explain it completely, but I believe it. And then the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to believe that. They don't believe he resurrected. Some don't. Uh, some don't believe he died. And that's why he was able to be back here in this planet again, but because he never really did die on the cross. And then talk about eternal hell. Now there's a subject. Eternal hell. Is there eternal hell? Well, here's my answer. What does the Bible say? Right. What does the Bible say about that? Is eternal hell in the Old Testament? Yeah. No. Yeah. Is it in the New Testament? No. Yeah. Is it going on right now? No. Yeah. Is it prophesied in the future? No. Yeah. There is an eternal hell. Fire. Everything the Bible says about it. Jesus Christ died. So we can escape the flames of eternal hell. Amen. He died for us. That's how important it is. God is the judge. And in His holiness, He must judge all mankind guilty. Because we are all guilty. But through Jesus Christ, everyone who believes on Him can be forgiven. Forgiven for your sins. But that's another one. Eternal hell. They just don't like that, do they? And I can understand why they don't like it. In a sense, I don't like it. I... I, I God Almighty is so holy, he has to punish sin. Or he'd destroy his own holiness. He wouldn't be holy anymore. So that's another thing. They don't like that one. They don't like the talking about the eternal hell. The purpose and efficacy of the blood of Christ, that used to be a subject more debated years ago than now. People pretty much now just ignore it. They don't really care about it. And then the, down to the note, and this is where we'll stop for tonight. The note, is the Bible really filled with contradictions? In reality, there are no contradictions in the Bible. How do you believe that? Yep. Mm -hmm. No contradiction. Nowhere? Not even one? Nope. Not even one little contradiction? No. Nope. There are no contradictions. If there's contradictions, it's not God's word. Amen. God inspired 100% of the Bible, and he preserved 100% of the Bible. No contradictions in the Bible, only uninformed conclusions, uninformed <laughs> conclusions based on a premise that the Bible must be wrong. Hmm. So some people pick up the Bible thinking it's wrong, and they read it with, with that thought in mind. And if they think parts of it are wrong, then maybe they think, well, that, I didn't like that part, so that must be one of those wrong parts. <laughs> That's the way people do. All right, any serious investigation is made. If a person is sincerely interested, though, in discovering the truth, he can always find, he can always find the truth, the truth. All right, so we'll continue next week. We'll come up with some good examples on the back side. On the back side of the notes, we have a couple of them we'll deal with next week. Baptism for the dead. Don't do it. And then healing, physical healing. By his stripes, we are healed. Well, doesn't that say we're healed? Well, what kind of healing? Physical healing or spiritual healing? So next week we'll continue with this study then. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that is without error. That, Lord, may we never get used to your word. May it always be something special and precious. Every time we pick it up to read and look at it, realize you're going to talk to us through that word in this way. Reading the word of God through your word. Thank you, Lord, for this book. Thank you we can believe what the scriptures say about salvation. 
and about God and about Jesus Christ, all these wonderful things. All the prophecies still not yet fulfilled, but we can already look forward to and enjoy, enjoy that time when we will see them fulfilled. What a joy that's going to be. So Father, bless now as we're dismissed. Thank you for all those that are out tonight. I pray that they've learned some things that were a blessing tonight and got, blessed, got a blessing tonight so we can be motivated to serve you, to serve the Lord. In Jesus' name now I pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.